Disc 25, The Truth By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 15x20 He took one look at the other dogs that were huddled around tree fire, then, then dived under the trailing folds of foul O.L. Iran's dreadful coat and whined. It took some time for the whole of the crew to understand what was going on. These were, after all, people who, could argue and expectorate and creatively misunderstand their way through a three-hour argument after someone said good morning. It was the duck man who finally got the message. These men are hunting terriers, he said. Right. It was the bloody newspaper. You can't bloody trust people who write in newspapers. They threw these doggies in the river. Right, said Gaspode. It's all gone fruit-shaped. Well, we can protect you too. Yeah, but I've got to be out and about. I'm a figure in this town. 232 I can't lie low. I need a disguise. Look, we could be looking at $50 here, right? But you need me to get it. The crew were impressed with this. In their cashless economy $50 was a fortune. Blew it, said Foul O.L. Iran. A dog's a dog, said Arnold sideways. On account of Bain called a dog. Gark, crowed Coffin Henry. That's true, said the duck man. A false beard isn't going to work. Well, your huge brains had better come up with something, cause I'm staying put until you do, said Gaspode. I've seen these men. They are not nice. There was a rumble from altogether Andrews. His face flickered as the various personalities reshuffled themselves, and then settled into the waxy bulges of Lady Hermione. We could disguise him, she said. What could you disguise a dog as, said the duck man. A cat. A dog is not just a dog, said Lady Hermione. A I think A I have an idea. The dwarfs were in a huddle when William got back. The epicenter of the huddle, it's huddly, turned out to be Mr. Dibbler, who looked just like anyone would look if they've been harangued. William had never seen anyone to whom the word harangued could be so justifiably applied. It meant someone who had been talked at by Satcher Issa for twenty minutes. Is there a problem, he said. Hello, Mr. Dibbler. Tell me, William, said Satcher Issa, while pacing slowly around Dibbler's chair. If stories were food, what kind of food would Goldfish Eats Cat be? What? William stared at Dibbler. Realization dawned. I think it would be a sort of long, thin kind of food, he said. Filled with rubbish of suspicious origin. Now, there's no need for anyone to take that tone Dibbler began, and then subsided under Sacharisa's glare. Yes, but rubbish that's sort of attractive. You'd keep on eating it 233 even though you wished you weren't, said William. What's going on here? Look, I didn't want to do it, Dibbler protested. Do what, said William. Mr. Dibbler's been writing those stories for the Inquirer, said Satcher Issa. I mean, no one believes what they read in the paper, right, said Dibbler. William pulled up a chair and sat straddling it, resting his arms on the back. So, Mr. Dibbler, when did you start pissing in the fountain of truth? William, snapped Satcher Issa. Look, times haven't been good. See, said Dibbler. And I thought, this news business. Well, people like to hear about stuff from a long way away, you know, like in the almanac plague of giant weasels in Hersheba, said William. That's the style. Well, I thought. It doesn't sort of matter if they're, you know, really true. I mean... William's glassy grin was beginning to make Dibbler uncomfortable. I mean, they're nearly true, aren't they? Everyone knows that sort of thing happens you didn't come to me said William. 
Well, of course not. Everyone knows you're a bit... a bit unimaginative about that sort of thing. You mean I like to know that things have actually happened? That's it, yes. Mr. Carney says people won't notice the difference anyway. He doesn't like you very much, Mr. DeWard. He's got wandering hands, said Sacharissa. You can't trust a man like that. William pulled the latest copy of the Inquirer towards him and picked a story at random. Man stolen by demons, he said. This refers to Mr. Ronnie Trust Me Big Holder, known to O'Cris appraise the troll more than $2,000, last seen buying a very fast horse. Well, where do the demons fit in? 234 Well, he could have been stolen by demons, said Dibbler. It could happen to anybody. What you mean, then, is that there is no evidence that he was not stolen by demons. That way people can make up their own minds, said Dibbler. That's what Mr. Carney says. People should be allowed to choose, he said. To choose what's true. He doesn't clean his teeth properly, either, said Sacharissa. I mean, I'm not one of those people who think cleanliness is next to godliness, but there are limits. Asterisk Dibbler shook his head sadly. I'm losing my touch, he said. Imagine. Me, working for someone? I must have been mad. It's the cold weather getting to me, that's what it is. Even. Wages, he said the word with a shudder, looked attractive. Do you know, he added, in a horrified voice, he was telling me what to do. Next time I'll have a quiet lie down until the feeling goes away. You are an immoral opportunist, Mr. Dibbler, said William. It's worked so far. Can you sell some advertising for us, said Sacharissa. I'm not going to work for anyone ag on commission, snapped Sacharissa. What? You want to employ him, said William. Why not? You can tell as many lies as you like if it's advertising. That's allowed, said Sacharissa. Please. We need the money. Commission, eh, said Dibbler, rubbing his unshaven chin. Like. 50% for you two and 50% for me, too. We'll discuss it, shall we, said Good Mountain, patting him on the shoulder. Dibbler winced. When it came to hard bargaining, dwarfs were diamond-tipped. Have I got a choice, he mumbled. Good Mountain leaned forward. His beard was bristling. He asterisk classically, very few people have considered that cleanliness is next to godliness, apart from in a very sternly abridged dictionary. A rank loincloth and hair in an advanced state of matted entanglement have generally been the badges of office of prophets whose injunction to disdain earthly things starts with soap. 235 wasn't currently holding a weapon but Dibbler could see, as it were, the great big axe that wasn't there. Absolutely, he said. Oh, said Dibbler. So. What would I be selling, exactly? Space, said Sacharissa. Dibbler beamed again. Just space. Nothing? Oh, I can do that. I can sell nothing like anything he shook his head sadly. It's only when I try to sell something that everything goes wrong. How did you come to be here, Mr. Dibbler? William asked. He was not happy with the answer. That sort of thing could work both ways, he said. You can't just dig into other people's property. He glared at the dwarfs. Mr. Bodini, I want that hole blocked up right now, understand? We only yes, yes, you did it for the best. And now I want it bricked up, properly. I want the hole to look as though it has never been there, thank you. I don't want anyone coming up the cellar ladder that didn't climb down it. 
Right now, please. I think I'm on to a real story, said William, as the disgruntled dwarfs filed away. I think I'm going to see Waffles. I've got as he pulled out his notebook something dropped onto the floor with a tinkle. Oh, yes. And I got the key to our townhouse, he said. You wanted a dress it's a bit late, said Satcherissa. I'd forgotten all about it, to tell the truth. Why not go and have a look while everyone else is busy? You could take Rocky, too. You know. To be on the safe side. But the place is empty. My father stays at his club if he has to come to town. Go on. There's got to be more to life than correcting copy. Satcherissa looked uncertainly at the key in her hand. My sister has quite a lot of dresses, said William. You want to go to the ball, don't you? I suppose MRS Hotbed could alter it for me if I take it to her in the morning, said Satcherissa expressing mildly peeved reluctance while her body language begged to be persuaded. 236 that's right, said William. And I'm sure you can find someone to do your hair properly. Sacharisa's eyes narrowed. It's true, you know, you have got an amazing way with words, she said. What are you going to do? I'm going, said William, to see a dog about a man. Sergeant Angwa peered up at Vims through the steam from the bowl in front of her. Sorry about this, sir, she said. His feet won't touch the ground, said Vims. You can't arrest him, sir, said Captain Carrot, putting a fresh towel over Angwa's head. Oh. Can't arrest him for assaulting an officer, eh? Well, that's where it gets tricky, doesn't it? Sir, said Angwa. You're an officer, sergeant, whatever shape you happen to be currently in. Yes, but... It's always been a bit convenient to let the werewolf thing stay a rumor, sir, said Carrot. Don't you think so? M.R. DeWard writes things down. Angwa and I aren't particularly keen on that. Those who need to know, know. Then I'll ban him from doing it. How, sir? Vims looked a little deflated. You can't tell me that as commander of police I can't stop some little T.I. some idiot from writing down anything he likes. Oh, no, sir. Of course you can. But I'm not sure you can stop him writing down that you stopped him writing things down, said Carrot. I'm amazed. Amazed. She's your... your friend, said Angwa, taking another deep sniff of the steam. But Carrot's right, Mr. Vims. I don't want this going any further. It was my fault for underestimating him. I walked right into it. I'll be fine in an hour or two. I saw what you were like when you came in, said Vims. You were a mess. It was a shock. The nose just shuts down. It was like walking around a corner and running into foul O.L.E. Ron. 237 ye gods. That bad. Maybe not quite as bad as that. Let it lie, sir. Please. He's a quick learner, R. M. R. De Ward, said Vims, sitting down at his desk. He's got a pen and a printing press and everyone acts like he's suddenly a major player. Well, he's going to have to learn a bit more. He doesn't want us watching? Well, we won't, anymore. He can reap what he sows for a while. We've got more than enough other things to do, heavens no. But he is technically see this sign on my desk, Captain. See it, Sergeant. It says Commander Vims. That means the buck starts here. It was a command you just got. Now, what else is new? Carrot nodded. Nothing good, sir. No one's found the dog. The guilds are all battening down. 
Mr. Scrope has been getting a lot of visitors. Oh, and High Priest R.I.D.C. Oli is telling everyone that he thinks Lord Veterinary went mad because the day before he'd been telling him about a plan to make lobsters fly through the air. Lobsters flying through the air, said Vims flatly. And something about sending ships by semaphore, sir. Oh, dear. And what is Mr. Scrope saying? Apparently he says he's looking forward to a new era in our history and will put Ankh-Morpork back on the path of responsible citizenship, sir. Is that the same as the lobsters? It's political, sir. Apparently he wants a return to the values and traditions that made the city great, sir. Does he know what those values and traditions were, said Vims, aghast. I assume so, sir said Carrot, keeping a straight face. Oh my gods! I'd rather take a chance on the lobsters. It was sleeting again, out of a darkening sky. The misbegot bridge was more or less empty, William lurked in the shadows, his hat pulled down over his eyes. Eventually a voice out of nowhere said, So. You got your bit of paper. Deep bone, said William startled out of the reverie. 238 I'm sending a a guide for you to follow, said the hidden informant. Name of Name of Trixie Bell. Just you follow him and everything will be okay. Ready? Yes. Deep Bone is watching me, William thought. He must be really close. Trixie Bell trotted out of the shadows. It was a poodle. More or less. The staff at L.E. Foil du Chien, the doggy beauty salon, had done their very best, and a craftsman will give of his or her all if it means getting foul O.L.E. Ron out of the shop any faster. They'd cut, blown, permed, crimped, primped, colored, woven, shampooed, and the manicurist had locked herself in the lavatory and refused to come out. The result was pink. The pinkness was only one aspect of the thing, but it was so pink that it dominated everything else, even the topiary effect tail with the fluffy knob on the end. The front of the dog looked as though it had been fired through a large pink ball and had only got halfway. Then there was also the matter of the large glittery collar. It glittered altogether too much. Sometimes glass glitters more than diamonds because it has more to prove. All in all, the effect was not of a poodle but of malformed Pudlia City. That is to say, everything about it suggested poodle except for the whole thing itself, which suggested walking away. Yep, it said, and there was something wrong with this, too. William was aware that dogs like this yipped, but this one, he was sure had said yip. There's a good. He began, and finished. Dog. Yip 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 sheesh yip, said the dog, and walked off. William wondered about the sheesh, but decided the dog must have sneezed. It trotted away through the slush and disappeared down an alley. A moment later its muzzle appeared around the corner. Yip. Wine. Oh. Yes. Sorry, said William. Trixie Bell led the way down greasy steps to the old path that ran 239 along the riverside. It was littered with rubbish, and anything that stays thrown away in Ankh-Morpork is real rubbish. The sun seldom got down here, even on a fine day. The shadows contrived to be freezing and running with water at the same time. Nevertheless, there was a fire among the dark timbers under the bridge. William realized, as his nostrils shut down, that he was visiting the canting crew. The old towpath had been deserted to start with, but foul O.L.E. Ron and the rest of them were the reason that it stayed that way. They had nothing to steal. They had precious little even to keep. Occasionally the Beggars Guild considered running them out of town, but without much enthusiasm. Even beggars need someone to look down on, 
and the crew were so far down that in a certain light they sometimes appeared to be on top. Besides, the guild recognized craftsmanship when they saw it, no one could spit and ooze like Coffin Henry, no one could be as legless as Arnold sideways and nothing in the world could smell like foul O.L. Iran. He could have used oil of scalatin as a deodorant. And, as that thought tripped through William's brain, he knew where Waffles was. I Trixie Bell's ridiculous pink tail disappeared into the mass of old packing cases and cardboard known variously to the crew as what, Bugreet, Tui, and Home. William's eyes were already watering. There wasn't much breeze down here. He made his way to the pool of firelight. Oh. Good evening, gentlemen, he managed, nodding to the figures around the green-edged flames. Let's see the color of your bit of paper, commanded the voice of Deep Bone, from out of the shadows. It's, E.R., off-white, said William, unfolding the check. It was taken by the duck man, who scanned it carefully and added noticeably to its off-whiteness. It seems to be in order. Fifty dollars, signed, he said. I have explained the concept to my associates. M.R. de Ward. It was not easy, I have to tell you. Yeah, and if you don't put up we'll come to your house, said Coffin Henry. 240 E.R. And do what, said William. Stand outside forever and ever and ever, said Arnold sideways. Looking at people in a funny way, said the duck man. Gobbin on their boots, said Coffin Henry. William tried not to think about M.R.S. Arcanum. He said. Now can I see the dog? Show him, Ron, commanded the voice of Deep Bone. Ron's heavy coat fell open, revealing Waffles blinking in the firelight. You had him, said William. That was all there was to it. Bugreet. Who's going to search foul O.L.E. Ron, said Deep Bone. Good point, said William. Very good point. Or smell him out. Now, you got to remember he's old, said Deep Bone. And he wasn't exactly Mr. Brain to start with. I mean, we're talking dogs here. Not talking dogs, said the voice hurriedly, but talking about dogs, I mean. So don't expect a philosophical treatise is what I'm saying. Waffles begged geriatrically when he saw William looking at him. How did he come to be with you, said William as Waffles sniffed his hand. He came running out of the palace straight under Ron's coat, said Deep Bone. Which is, as you point out, the last place anyone would look, said William. You'd better believe it, and not even a werewolf would find him there. William took out his notebook, turned to a fresh page, and wrote. Waffles, he said, how old is he? Waffles barked. Sixteen, said Deep Bone. Is that important? It's a newspaper thing, said William. He wrote. Waffles, sixteen, formerly of the palace, Ank Morpork, I'm interviewing a dog, he thought. Man interviews dog. That's nearly news. So. E.R., Waffles, what happened before you ran out of the palace, he said. 241 Deep Bone, from his hiding place, whined and growled. Waffles cocked an ear and then growled back. He woke up and experienced a moment of horrible philosophical uncertainty, said Deep Bone. I thought you said I'm translating right. And this was on account of there being two gods in the room. That's too Lord Veterinarus, Waffles being an old-fashioned kind of dog. But he knew one was wrong because he smelled wrong. And there were two other men. And then William scribbled furiously. Twenty seconds later Waffles bit him hard on the ankle. The clerk in Mr. Slant's front office looked down from his high desk at the two visitors, sniffed and carried on with his laborious copper plate. 
he did not have a lot of time for the notion of customer service. The law could not be hurried a moment later his head was rammed into the desktop and held down by some enormous weight. Mr. Pin's face appeared in his limited vision. I said, said Mr. Pin, that Mr. Slant wants to see us. SNGH, said the clerk. Mr. Pin nodded and the pressure was relieved slightly. Sorry. You were saying, said Mr. Pin, watching the man's hand creep along the edge of the desk. He's not seeing anyone. The words ended in a muffled yelp. Mr. Pin leaned down. Sorry about the fingers, he said, but we can't have them naughty little things creeping to that little lever there, can we? No telling what might happen if you pulled that lever. Now. Which one's Mr. Slant's office? Second. Door. On. Left. The man groaned. See. It's so much nicer when we're polite. And in a week, two at the outside, you'll be able to pick up a pen again. Mr. Pin nodded to Mr. Tulip, who let the man go. He slithered to the floor. You want I should? Ing scrag him. Leave him, said Mr. Pin. I think I'm going to be nice to people today. 242 He had to hand it to Mr. Slant. When the new firm stepped into his office the lawyer looked up and his expression barely flickered. Gentlemen, he said. Don't press a ing thing, said Mr. Tulip. There's something you should know, said Mr. Pin, pulling a box out of his jacket. And what is that, said Mr. Slant. Mr. Pin flicked a catch on the side of the box. Let's hear about yesterday, he said. The imp blinked. Nyeb. Nyeb nyeb. Nyeb did. Nyeb. It said. It's just working its way backwards, said Mr. Pin. What is this, said the lawyer. Nyeb nyeb. Sinyeb. Nib. Is valuable. Mr. Pin. So I will not spin this out. What did you do with the dog? Mr. Pin's finger touched another lever. Weedle weedle wee. My. Clients have long memories and deep pockets. Other killers can be hired. Do you understand me? There was a tiny ouch as the off lever hit the imp on the head. Mr. Slant got up and walked across to an ancient cabinet. Would you like a drink, Mr. Pin? I am afraid I have only embalming fluid not yet, Mr. Slant. And I think I probably have a banana somewhere Mr. Slant turned, smiling beatifically, at the sound of the smack of Mr. Pin catching Mr. Tulip's arm. I told you I'm gonna. Ing kill him too late, alas, said the lawyer, sitting down again. Very well. Mr. Pin. This is about money, is it? All we're owed, plus another fifty thousand. But you haven't found the dog. Nor have the watch. And they've got a werewolf. Everyone's looking for the dog. The dog's gone. But that doesn't matter. This little box matters. That is very little in the way of evidence really. You asking us about the dog? Talking about killers? I reckon that Vim's character will niggle away at something like 243 that. He doesn't sound like the sort to let things go. Mr. Pin smiled humorlessly. You've got stuff on us but, well, between you and me, he leaned closer, some of the things we've done might be considered, well, tantamount to crimes all them. Ing murders, for a start said Mr. Tulip, nodding. Which, since we are criminals, could be called typical behavior. Whereas, Pin went on, you're a respectable citizen. Doesn't look good, respectable citizens getting involved in this sort of thing. People talk. To save. 
Misunderstandings, said Mr. Slant, I will do you a draft of jewels, said Mr. Pin. We like jewels, said Mr. Tulip. You have made copies of that thing, said Slant. I'm not saying anything, said Mr. Pin, who hadn't and didn't even know how. But he took the view that Mr. Slant was in no position to be other than cautious, and it looked as though Mr. Slant thought so too. I wonder if I can trust you, said Mr. Slant, as if to himself. Well, you see, it's like this, said Mr. Pin, as patiently as he could. His head was feeling worse. If news got around that we'd shopped a client, that wouldn't be good. People would say, you can't trust a person of that kind of ilk. They do not know how to behave. But if the people we deal with heard we'd scragged a client because the client had not played fair, then they would say to themselves, these are businessmen. They are businesslike. They do business he stopped and looked at the shadows in the corner of the room. And, said Mr. Slant. And. And. The hell with this, said Mr. Pin blinking and shaking his head. Give us the jewels, Slant, or Mr. Tulip will do the asking, understand? We're getting out of here, with your damned dwarfs and vampires and trolls and dead men walking. This city gives me the creeps. So give me the diamonds. Right now. Very well, said Mr. Slant. And the imp. It goes with us. We get caught, it gets caught. We die mysteriously, then. Some people find out about things. When we are 244 safely away. You're in no position to argue, slant. Mr. Pin shuddered. 1 a.m. not having a good day. Mr. Slant pulled open a desk drawer and tossed three small velvet bags onto the leather top. Mr. Pin mopped his brow with a handkerchief. Take a look at M, Mr. Tulip. There was a pause while both men watched Mr. Tulip pour the gems into one enormous palm. He scrutinized several through an eyeglass. He sniffed at them. He gingerly licked one or two. Then he picked four out of the heap and tossed them back to the lawyer. You think I'm some kind of a... ing idiot, he said. Don't even think of arguing, said Mr. Pin. Perhaps the jewelers made a mistake, said Mr. Slant. Yeah, said Mr. Pin. His hand darted into his jacket again, but this time came out holding a weapon. Mr. Slant looked into the muzzle of a spring gun. It was technically and legally a crossbow, in that human strength compressed the spring but it had been reduced by patient technology to a point where it was more or less a pipe with a handle and a trigger. Anyone caught with one by the Assassin's Guild, it was rumored, would find its ability to be hidden on the human body tested to extremes, any city watch that found one used against them would see to it that the offender's feet did not touch the ground but instead swung gently as the breeze pushed them around. There must have been a switch in this desk, too. A door flew open and two men burst in, one armed with two long knives, one with a crossbow. It was quite horrible, what Mr. Tulip did to them. It was, in its way, a kind of skill. When an armed man runs into a room in the knowledge that there is trouble he needs a fraction of a second to assess, to decide, to calculate, to think. Mr. Tulip didn't need a fraction of a second. He didn't think. His hands moved by themselves. It required, even for the calculating eyes of Mr. Slant, a mental action replay. And even in the slow MO of horror, it was hard to see Mr. Tulip grab the nearest chair and swing it. At the end of the blur 245 two men lay unconscious, one with an arm twisted in a disconcerting way, and a knife was shuddering in the ceiling. Mr. Pin hadn't turned round. He kept the gun pointed at the zombie. But he produced from a pocket a small cigarette lighter in the shape of a dragon, and then Mr. Slant. 
Mr. Slant, who crackled when he walked and smelled of dust. Mr. Slant saw, wrapped around the evil little bolt that just projected from the tube, a wad of cloth. Without taking his eyes off the lawyer Mr. Pin applied the flame. The cloth flared. And Mr. Slant was very dry indeed. This is a bad thing I'm about to do, Pin said, as if hypnotized. But I've done so many bad things, this one will hardly count. It's like... A killing is a big thing, but another killing, that's kind of half the size. You know? So it's, like, when you've done twenty killings, they barely notice, on average. But... It's a nice day today, the birds is singing, there's stuff like... Kittens and stuff, and the sun is shining off the snow, bring in the promise of spring to come, with flowers and fresh grass, and more kittens and hot summer days and the gentle kiss of the rain and wonderful clean things which you won't ever see if you don't give us what's in that drawer cause you'll burn like a torch you double dealing twisty dried up cheating son of a bitch. Mr. Slant scrabbled in the drawer and threw down another velvet bag. Glancing nervously at his partner, who'd never even mentioned kittens before except in the same sentence as water barrel. Mr. Tulip took it and examined the contents. Rubies, he said. In good ones. Now go away from here, rasped Mr. Slant. Right away. Never come back. I've never heard of you. I've never seen you. He stared at the spluttering flame. Mr. Slant had faced many bad things in the last few hundred years but right now nothing seemed more menacing than Mr. Pin. Or more erratically deranged, either. The man was swaying, and his gaze kept flickering into the shadowy corners of the room. Mr. Tulip shook his partner's shoulder. Let's. Ing scrag him and go, he suggested. Pin blinked. Right, he said, appearing to return to his own head. Right. He glanced at the zombie. I think I shall let you live today, 246 he said, blowing out the flame. Tomorrow. Who knows? It wasn't a bad threat, but somehow his heart wasn't in it. Then the new firm had gone. Mr. Slant sat down and stared at the closed door. It was clear to him, and a dead man has experience in these matters, that his two armed clerks, veterans of many a legal battle, were beyond help. Mr. Tulip was an expert. He took a sheet of writing paper from a drawer, wrote a few words in block letters, sealed it in an envelope and sent for another clerk. Have arrangements made, he said, when the man stared at his fallen colleagues, and then take this to De Ward. Which one, sir? For a moment Mr. Slant had forgotten that point. Lord de Ward, he said. Definitely not the other one. William de Ward turned a page in his notebook and continued to scribble. The crew were watching him as if he was a public entertainment. That's a grand gift you have there, sir, said Arnold sideways. It does the heart good to see the pencil waggling like that. I wish I had the knowing of it, but I've never been mechanical. Would you care for a cup of tea, said the duck man. You drink tea down here. Of course. Why not? What kind of people do you think we are? The duck man held up a blackened teapot and a rusty mug with an inviting smile. It was probably a good moment to be polite, thought William. Besides, the water would have been boiled, wouldn't it? No milk, though he said quickly. He could imagine what the milk would be like. Ah, I said you were a gentleman, said the duck man, pouring a tarry brown liquid into the mug. Milk and tea is an abomination. He picked up, with a dainty gesture, a plate and pair of tongs. Slice of lemon, he added. Lemon. You have lemon. Oh, 
even Mr. Ron here would rather wash under his arms than 247 have anything but lemon in his tea, said the duck man, plopping a slice into William's mug. And four sugars, said Arnold sideways. William took a deep draught of the tea. It was thick and stewed, but it was also sweet and hot. And slightly lemony. All in all, he considered, it could have been much worse. Yes, we're very fortunate when it comes to slices of lemon, said the duck man, busily fussing over the tea things. Why, it is indeed a bad day when we can't find two or three slices floating down the river. William stared fixedly at the river wall. Spit or swallow, he thought, the eternal conundrum. Are you all right, M.R. de Ward? M.M.F. too much sugar. M.M.F., not too hot. William gratefully sprayed the tea in the direction of the river. Ah, he said. Yes. Too hot. That's what it was. Too hot. Lovely tea but. Too hot. I'll just put the rest down here by my foot to cool down, shall I? He snatched up his pencil and pad. So. E.R., Waffles, which man was it that you bit on the leg? Waffles barked. He bit all of them, said the voice of Deep Bone. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.